Hey everyone, you're listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast in which philosophers, theologians, and literary critics discuss how literature can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. As always, I'm your host, Jennifer Frey. I'm a philosopher at the University of South Carolina, and I'm a fellow at the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. As always, I'd like to thank my sponsors for their support of this podcast. First and foremost, the Institute for Human Ecology, which underwrites this podcast. The IHE is an academic institute committed to research into the conditions vital for human flourishing. To learn more about the IHE and all the events and programs they put on, please go to their website, ihe.catholic.edu. And I'd also like to thank The Lamp and The Point magazines for underwriting my Patreon page. You can go to patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod to sign up to be a monthly patron. As a $10 monthly patron, you can get a free digital subscription to either The Lamp or The Point magazines. The Lamp is a bi-monthly, lay-edited journal of Catholic letters. To read some of their content, please go to thelampmagazine.com. And The Point is a magazine of philosophical writing. You can check out the fall issue at thepointmag.com. I'm extremely pleased to get to episode 58 of the podcast, in which I chat with Justin E.H. Smith about the pleasures of reading Edgar Allan Poe. This is the last episode of 2022, and as always, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Sacred and Profane Love. I'm just ecstatic to have Justin E.H. Smith back on the podcast. I kind of feel like he doesn't need an introduction, but if you don't know who he is, he has an amazing substack called The Hinternet. The Hinternet. I first got to know Justin through his books on Leibniz, which are also fantastic, but he's a philosopher. Well, I don't know. You're kind of hard to describe. You're you're a genuine man of letters, a Renaissance man. Anyway, welcome back to the podcast, Justin. Thanks so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Hope I don't let you down. <laughs> no, you're not going to. So I want to talk about Edgar Allan Poe for this episode. It's kind of the perfect day to talk about Poe here. Mm-hmm. Like the weather is ominous and vaguely threatening and mm-hmm. kind of, mm-hmm. you know, like death and decay. It's like a very Poe aesthetic yeah. here today. Well, I don't know what it's like where you are. I'm always off schedule. You know, a lot of people try to time this sort of thing for Halloween, but, you know, whatever. Every day is Halloween. (laughs) No, I actually think so. My English teacher in high school, she used to call November the Edgar Allan Mm. Poe month, right? Right, Because by the time you get to November, it's like some of the sparkle and thrill of autumn is gone and it's right, just kind of right. like gray and oppressive right, and right. S- again this kind of <laughs> you yeah. know, atmosphere of dread hangs over everything <laughs> right, so right, right. so yeah i think she was onto something <laughs> and i i guess like we we sort of cooked up this idea of talking about poe because maybe three sub stacks ago, maybe four, mm. I don't know. You you put out so much content, it's hard for me mm. to keep up. But it was it was a fiction. Yeah. I think it was called Bugaloo. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah, in case listeners haven't read it yet, it's easy to find. But basically, I love Poe so much that I wanted to do an exercise of writing in the style of Poe to kind of learn his secrets. And I used a story of his that I really like that we can talk about uh, in detail perhaps today called The Man That Was Used Up. Uh, And this is a story about an officer from the Indian Wars somewhere in the interior of the United States who has, we slowly learn, been scalped and amputated and disemboweled in all sorts of ways, except the narrator, when he first meets the person, doesn't realize this Uh because he's been put back together using prosthetics and state-of-the-art technology, state-of-the-art circa 1830. Right. (laughs) And it's remarkable to see how much 
Poe anticipates cyborg fiction, really, in mm -hmm. um, in this most unlikely story. So, yeah, I hope I did him justice. <laughs> but that's that's kind of what uh, got me really thinking about Poe recently, trying to really zero in and figure out what I, where I think his particular gen genius lies. But this had been preceded by several months this summer when I read The Collected Tales, and also the closest thing he has to a novel, the, the Arthur Gordon Pym novel that we can maybe talk mm -hmm. about as well. Mm -hmm. And really, it was this summer, the summer of my 50th year, that I paid attention to him. I had read The Telltale Heart when I was in elementary school, and I, I find that curious too, that our teachers assigned these tales to us at all. I, I don't it, think I read it in elementary school. I did yeah. read it, you know, uh, definitely junior high mm. and then again in high school. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And maybe we can, you know, we can try to work out. Um, I mean, what interests me and what I've been thinking about a lot recently is this strange way that the Poe, an author like Poe, comes to us in our high school, junior high school, elementary school education, kind of wrapped with a safety seal, as if our teachers are so certain that because this is just fiction, we will not come out of this experience warped. And this <laughs> might just be... <laughs> I, I mean, I wasn't warped by it, but I was also, I bought into the messaging from our teachers. Whereas this past summer, when I was reading him, I felt um, uh, really destabilized, right? Like really, truly convinced that this might need to come with more than a warning label, but maybe actually some censorship, right? And I mean, in my, in my experience, Let's see. I, I've I've had that feeling with Philip Roth, a few other authors. When I'm thick in the novel and I love it, but I'm also thinking someone needs to censor this guy. <laughs> and I I, th I think that's a really interesting moment in yeah. the experience of literature. Yeah, the dangers of reading. Well, yeah. I don't I don't remember how Poe was sold to me, but mm. I do remember absolutely loving it from mm. the beginning. Mm. And just wanting to read more and more of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was definitely very hooked from early on. And I think I told you, like, I, I read Poe every autumn. You mm -hmm, know, I'll just, mm -hmm. like, find time to read it because I just, I love it. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have this book that's basically like his collected works. And it's easy. I mean, the thing about Poe is for so much of it, it's short, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you, you can just pick it up and read a story and, mm -hmm. you know, it's less than whatever. It's 30 minutes of your time, depending, mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. depending on what kind of reader you are. And it's just so I always get something different from it. Yeah. Every time, like I see something that I absolutely didn't see before, but I also just like, you know, I don't know what this says about me because I also mm -hmm. love, I love horror films. I love mm -hmm. Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love all of that stuff. But, mm -hmm. but Poe in particular, it just evokes these feelings of dread, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. like foreboding mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. sort of like, mm -hmm. you know, Especially if you've kind of forgotten, which happens to mm -hmm. me all the time because my brain's like a sieve. And so <laughs> I've read something, but I don't like I just I don't remember the ending. Yeah. And so I get there mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, my dear, sweet Lord mm -hmm. Jesus. <laughs> like, yeah, right, that, right, is, right. that is yeah. very dark, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very disturbing. And I don't know what it says about me that I, I <laughs> like that, but I do. Mm -hmm. It's this feeling of being deeply unsettled and jolted out of the everyday somehow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. just like face death and horror and madness. I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. You know, personally, I don't like horror films. 
I mean, either they don't work on me, in, you know, I'm not scared, I'm bored, or they do work on me and it's unpleasant and I, and I just want to <laughs> leave the room. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I've never, I've never been into horror films. And I've never really been, I mean, it's weird because I'm, you know, I, when I was uh, younger, I was, I was so much into, uh, you know, going straight for the most highbrow stuff possible. And it's like now I'm just starting to learn to enjoy proper entertainments, right? Like, <laughs> like Poe and Mary Shelley and so on. And uh, so I'm finally having a bit of fun reading literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the spirit I, I bring to reading Poe. And I, I have to say also that these are tales of gothic horror filled with dread and so on. But he's also a really good satirist, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something really funny about, about his work. I mean, the, the man that was used up is just sheer anti-war mm -hmm. satire, right? Mm -hmm. Like just showing the absolute cravenness and hollowness of the figure of the brave you know, the brave soldier. Mm -hmm. And he does this in a funny, deconstructive way that I think I probably appreciate more than, than, than the gothic horror. And I also, mm. I think this is something that, you know, we were talking just before we started recording, we were talking about Mary Shelley kind of placing the two in comparison. I don't mm -hmm. think Mary Shelley is particularly funny. I don't think she, she, I, I think she's dutifully spinning out a tale of, of, of gothic horror that's important because it's also a science fiction template, but there's, there's no zaniness to it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what I love about Poe most. Well, I think that, if you compare Poe to either of those other writers, like Lovecraft mm. or Shelley, he's just mm. better, in my opinion. I <laughs> mm -hmm, mean, because mm -hmm. because of his range, because yeah. he wrote in way more genres. Yeah. I mean, it, he invented the detective novel, which yeah, I think people yeah. really like forget or didn't right. know. Right, right, right. And then he does write satire. He does write science fiction. I mean, he's just kind of every... And of course, he was a, a very accomplished poet in his own right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so the range that he has yeah. as a writer, and then also I just think the talent as a writer. Yeah. It's sort of like, I, look, I love Lovecraft. <laughs> I'm just going to be really upfront about that. But like, how many times can you describe something as an eldritch <laughs> horror? <laughs> You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It's like at yeah. some point you're just laughing, like oh, well, it's let, another. Okay, okay, let's yeah, let's let's talk about Lovecraft for a second and and work our way back to Poe with this. So you know, I I read a bit of Lovecraft this summer as well. This was my kind of summer of adolescent reading, <laughs> weird um, fiction. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I the the tales of Antarctica are particularly interesting. I think. Think. Mm -hmm. um, and really, for me, filled in a huge gap in my understanding of the sources of a lot of this kind of paranormal esoteric projection onto that continent. And I'm like, oh, okay, so this is where it comes from. But you might remember in his long tale about, um, about Antarctica, Lovecraft also uses Poe's Arthur Gordon Pym as a sort of urtext. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to read uh, that work, which is the longest work Poe has written and is the first Antarctic adventure novel, mm -hmm. right? Which is mm -hmm. very significant given that when he was writing it, people were not yet certain about the existence of the Antarctic continent. And mm -hmm. of course, what Poe projects down there is completely, completely fantastical. He projects a kind of tropical zone that is much more like the kind of racist, exoticist representations of South Sea Islanders mm -hmm. in the early 19th century. Right. 
But it's fascinating to see Poe and Lovecraft in dialogue on these two points. And it's also an inversion of this much older trope that we see in science fiction, including Mary Shelley, right, with, where Frankenstein both begins and ends in a voyage to the North Pole, right, mm -hmm. as a place where, pre where it's thought that space and time warp in some weird way, and you can maybe go into the center of the earth or blast into another dimension or something. And we see this as early as the 17th century and people like Margaret Cavendish, the blazing world. So it's really interesting to see the genealogy of, how should I put it, like exploration adventure science fiction mashed together in this way that I think Poe does best, even when this, this novel, Arthur Gordon Pym, is just totally screwball. It's just totally gonzo. You know, mm -hmm. he doesn't, mm -hmm. he doesn't seem to know what he's doing from one, right. fr from one page to the next. Right. But somehow, like, this is, you know, this is the real mark of genius in my view, when, you know, your worst work reveals what a genius you are as much as your best work. Right. And right. I think that's, I think that's true with Arthur Gordon Pym. Anyway, right. so that's, yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think he kind of recognized it was a bit of a mess. Yeah. They didn't yeah. really know. Like, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, so, sorry. Now, have you seen John Carpenter's The Thing? The horror no, movie? No, I haven't. No, 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 well, no. You have to. Like, okay, you, I like, like you are so primed <laughs> to watch <laughs> this movie. Okay, I promise. And then you can just. We'll just see what, what comes of it. If there's okay. a sub stack on it, I won't be surprised. <laughs> well, I'm also just curious. I'm sorry, this is an aside, but I have to ask mm -hmm. before I forget. What horror movies have actually scared you? Oh, I don't know. Poltergeist when I was like 10 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the, the short lady, you know, the yeah, weird. Yeah. I, I forget who she was, but uh -huh. she really, really scared me. Yeah, she's scary. <laughs> <laughs> she's scary although i think in that whole cycle the um the crazy preacher is the scariest the i don't guy who's I don't, like singing god is in his holy temple <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't i don't remember honestly i mean this the fact that i have to reach back to a movie that came out in like 1983 <laughs> shows you how how untrained i am wow. in, in horror movies <laughs> yeah yeah you have to watch john carpenter's the thing okay okay uh, just I promise me that you will mm. okay so before we get to edgar Allan poe we were going to talk a little bit about a different kind of horror and spectacle that you actually wrote about on your Substack, which is what happened to our mutual friend agnes callard on twitter oh. <laughs> Speaking of horror. <laughs> yeah, what a horror story. I mean, it is a bit like Shirley Jackson level of freakiness when, when you realize how zombified people can become when they're, when they're pumped up alongside everyone else as part of the mob. It really is a kind of horror, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so so Agnes, who is a philosopher who has been on both of our podcasts, <laughs> so probably our listeners will know who we're talking about. She's a former colleague of mine at Chicago. Mm -hmm. Oh, right, of course, yeah. Yeah, so I'm I've known Agnes since like 2010. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so, so Agnes uh, just had a stupid tweet about how. She throws away her kids' Halloween candy. Because if you're a parent in the United States, you know that your children get a completely obscene amount of yeah. candy that they can't possibly eat, right? You, I mean, mm -hmm. you just, you either have to hide it or you have to do something, right? Or actually the negligent parenting thing to do is to just let them, you know, gorge themselves yeah. until it's they terrible, vomit yeah. or something. So she has this like family tradition where it's like, okay, you, yeah, you get to eat your candy and then I throw it away. <laughs> so you wake up the next day and you don't have any more Halloween candy, which by the way is one, not a big deal because as people who live in the United States know, people give your kids candy literally every day, every day of your life <laughs> yeah. at school 
wherever. There's candy everywhere. This isn't totally even not. like... They're not living in some kind of deprivation. And then there's this one day a year where there's candy. And so it's amazing. Right. It's not even what's interesting about Halloween. It's not like an orange on Christmas. You know? <laughs> you know <laughs> right. Like in the old exactly. days, an orange right. in your Christmas stocking. I know. Yeah. Right? That would be cruel to throw the orange away. Exactly. In, uh, yeah. Right? If that was the best thing you got all year. <laughs> right. So anyway, so the whole, the whole thing, the reason that I underscore this is that she didn't commit some act of, you know, a mommy dearest cruelty or something. <laughs> it's just like a completely normal thing to do. Mm. And then she just gets dogpiled, yeah. right? For, yeah. for days. Yeah. And I think like at first, I was, am I was mildly amused, right? Because mm. I was like, oh my gosh, they're trying to bean dad Agnes. <laughs> that's absurd like the only yeah. possible response to this is to laugh yeah but then it got very dark very mm. quickly because what happens in all these cases is it starts out one it starts out about one thing yeah you know that everybody's mad about but then it's the internet and right. so they look into yeah. any possible transgression that you've yeah. ever committed ever yeah. So that they can put you up on the scaffold and the pillory yeah. and just, right, yeah. go in for the spectacle, right? And that's, that's what it became. It became this, like, weird, not weird. I, weird isn't a strong enough word. It became this disgusting spectacle where yeah. everybody had to pile on. And but we've seen it. We've seen it so many times, though. I know. I, I, it it follow, always follows the same pattern. I mean, you know, people t t always tell me I'm exaggerating when I, when I make historical comparisons to the Moscow show trials, right? But there was a, a familiar line uh, in the context of Stalinist purges, show me the man and I'll find the crimes to match him, right? right? And even if we aren't, like, you know, shooting people in basements right now. We're just, right. you know, doing something I admit is not as not as grave. Um, nonetheless, that is a real parallel where, you know, basically anyone, or at least anyone who's been alive long enough to have done anything, to have made mistakes <laughs> in this world, is susceptible to having their past dug into and having something that can right. be found. I mean, I certainly am. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. And so it's it's it, that's really shocking. Two things are really shocking. One, that people can do this without realizing how Stalinist it is. Right. And two, that that they really presume they're in a position to know what the dynamics within another family that they don't personally know actually are, right? And it's just like the, the only people who can be making such judgments are people who just haven't lived yet, you know, don't know. It was so many people, though. <laughs> yeah. And, and I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to name names, but I was pretty distressed by some of the people who... <laughs> We're not only just piling on, but like justifying it. Like, yeah. well, if you're on Twitter, what do you expect? And I'm like, yeah. I expect like for people to remember that I'm or like a real human being. I'm yeah. a real human being. My children are real. Like they're real. Yeah. They're also real human beings. Our family is real. Yeah. And, you know, and the fact that it's not just the topsy turvy upside down counter world. Like yeah. Agnes received death threats on her cell phone. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, she was just like, how do they have my number? And I'm like, I don't yeah. know. This is so crazy. It's, and yeah. And then even if nothing comes from it other than being publicly humiliated for four days yeah. in a row, which yeah. let's not downplay that. that. something, yeah. yeah As yeah, if yeah, that's, that's just... Nothing. Especially, I mean, es yeah, especially when it threatens your your employment status. I, I think exactly. that's where it starts to be, you know, very, very real beyond. 
which, beyond yeah, psychological which, torture. Which, of no. course, they were calling her department yeah. chair and yeah. calling the president of her university. And Agnes is very lucky in that, you know, she works at a university that's kind of renowned yeah. for yeah. being very hospitable to mm. faculty speech. But, of course, mm. we know that that's not... I mean, the reason they're so well known is that this isn't, in fact, the de facto position. Right, yeah. And plenty of professors have lost their job because of something they said on Twitter. Yeah, yeah. And it really is completely disgusting. Absolutely, yeah. That we're doing this to people. And so I... (laughs) I don't know. I've, I found yeah. it really dark. For me, the comparison wasn't so much Stalinist, but was someone who was actually influenced by Poe, and that is Hawthorne's A Scarlet oh, right, Letter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. And that's just because I had recently re- reread it for this oh, podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the second chapter in that novel, it just, which is when Hester Prynne is mm. on the scaffold and being pilloried by... Yeah. But you know, is, is is made into the malefactress. I love that word. That's Hawthorne's <laughs> word. And th- what, th- like the psychological dynamic is yeah. what's so interesting ab- about that chapter. And be- and yeah. the psychological dynamic hasn't changed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The public scaffold has changed, mm-hmm. and the nature of the way that we. Right. Like put people in the stocks has yeah. changed. Yeah. But the basic psychological dynamic hasn't changed. And it's this ratcheting up, right? Yeah. It's this constant, like, because what happens to Hester Prynne is she's she has to wear the scarlet A, and then all of these gossipy Puritan women are like, Well, is that enough? You know, and then one is like, she should be branded in her skin. And the other one's like, no, she should be killed. (laughs) And it's just like this. And then they're like, well, not only should she be killed, that somehow wasn't enough. And you just see how it like escalates. Yeah. And the way the, um, the other thing is that people really, the pleasure that they get. Mm Mm-hmm in engaging yeah, sure. in in what is sure. the spectacle right yeah and like you see that playing out online mm-hmm. and there are the people who are horrified by it mm-hmm. right and are sort of like no this is actually like really dark mm-hmm. like like you can try to dress this up in something yeah. else yeah but this is actually yeah. like extremely dark impulses you know yeah. on display here yeah and and then there are just so many people who are refuse can't see it or refuse to see it or yeah. even worse in my mind justify it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Justify the yeah. gossip, justify the just mm. the the whole dynamic as like what do you expect if you're going to yeah. if you're going to be a public figure you should expect crucifixion. And I'm right, like, wait, right. how is that reasonable? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, there's a, a, it's totally out of all reasonable measure. University professors are not, are not celebrities. They're not living in some high castle right. in a way that Twitter seems to suppose they are, which again, uh, further buttresses my conviction that the people who get swept up in this are real ignoramuses. They just don't know anything. They think university professors are are rich and famous, right? Mm -hmm. And that alone is a strong count against (laughs) believing (laughs) anything they say. But, you know, beyond that, I would say one thing, and that is that, look, you know, the Puritans and people in Moscow in 1938 lived in a closed space, right? They didn't have anywhere to go. I mean, I guess the Puritans could flee and live with the Native Americans if things got really bad. Some did, you know, but for Mm -hmm. the most part, they had no other options. And I think, and this is a point that I never know how to pronounce his name. Ross Douthat has, Douthat, has Mm -hmm. has made repeatedly about about our neo-Puritan 
moment, which is that it's never going to become all encompassing. Right, there are always going to be counterforces that will make it possible for us to say, "I'm not going to wear your stupid scarlet letter." <laughs> you、mm-hmm. know, get away from me, you weirdos.、Mm-hmm. And、um, and so I I think that's I mean I say that maybe just to console myself, but、mm-hmm. there is strong kickback against the the Twitter Red Guards efforts to. Seize full power and make、mm-hmm. the professors wear the dunce cap and、mm-hmm. walk the gauntlet of shame or whatever.、Mm-hmm. We're not there yet because、um, because sources of power and legitimacy are 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 more distributed than in these other extreme cases in history.、I'm、not saying it's not bad. I'm just saying. That、mm-hmm. look, I mean, I still say whatever I want. I don't say it on Twitter. I left Twitter because of what、mm-hmm. ha- happened to Agnes.、Mm-hmm. But I still say everything that's on my mind、mm-hmm. on podcasts, on Substack, and I'm not exactly persona non grata. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, or maybe, right. maybe I'm maybe I'm delusional. Maybe I am. I don't know. Right. I think for me, though, the thing that in this case in particular. Which was obviously personal, so fine. But it was personal more than just that I have a long history with Agnes. Yeah, and I also know that like a bunch of the stuff that was said about her is just like wrong. It's crazy, but、yeah. whatever.、Yeah. But also, just I think the way it went from like cruel mom to wicked、mm-hmm. slut was、It's、like shocking, yeah. really. Yeah, super shocking. Like it really. I mean, I I just, I just wanted to vomit. Like I was、yeah. like, I don't know. And and I think that、um, the fact that that can happen so quickly,、mm-hmm. and it、yeah. just it just、yeah. doesn't matter what you've accomplished. It doesn't、yeah. matter like how hard you've fought for whatever reputation you have. That、yeah. you will just get put into that narrative. By yeah, total strangers yeah, who yeah, don't give a shit about you, yeah, and who are just enjoying watching yeah, your downfall, yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's just like I don't know. I mean, I lost sleep over that.、Oh, <laughs> I, 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 I was like, this is this is bad. <laughs> It seems really bad. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's bad. It's bad. But it's bad. But we'll we'll push through and. I mean, it's shocking that there is no progress, and that we're just as bad off as as they were in the 17th century in Plymouth, Massachusetts.、Mm-hmm. On the other hand, we can take some solace in the fact that that this is a pretty stable a、uh, source of. Disappointment in the media. <laughs> yes. Ex- well,、right? I, <laughs> yes. I I believe in original sin, which I sort of feel like you know <laughs> explains this to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But still, you know, <laughs> <laughs> one still wants a little bit of grace and mercy. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Poe. So let's talk about a、yeah. different kind of horror. Yeah. Should we? Do, is there a Should we start with Bernice? Where do you want to sure, start? Sure. Yeah. 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 Bernice is, I think, a wonderful tale, and I, you know, I,、uh, I might as well just, yeah, describe the context. I've, I've been writing about Bernice because I'm writing a piece for Harper's that originally involved a long reflection on the parallel lives of Edgar Allan Poe and Jerry Lee Lewis. Both of whom married their thirteen-year-old first cousins, or yes. Mar- married yes. in scare quotes, if if you don't believe that's possible、uh-huh. without without consent. But what's interesting to me in these cases is the liberal stance that I think young progressives today want to reject. The liberal stance in this case that you should be able to recognize that the person was morally atrocious and nonetheless appreciate their art is not so simple because in both of their cases it's pretty clear that part of what is giving their art its verve, its mojo, is the fact that they are morally monstrous, right? And 
We don't need to talk about Jerry Lee Lewis here, but I think he is just absolutely on fire in the few years after he gets basically exiled from the United States because everyone is so horrified when they mm -hmm. learn that he's married to his 13-year-old cousin. Then he mm -hmm. goes on tour in Europe, and it's, and it's, it's an extremely high period for his art. Mm -hmm. Similarly with Poe, his, his suffering over the fact that he is a moral monster who married his first, the 13 year old cousin is reflected in his ability to go down into the depths of the horror tale, right? Mm -hmm. And nothing shows that more clearly than Bernice. Mm -hmm. in, the t in the story, it's a rather short story. In the story, a man lives in a creaky old mansion with his first cousin named Bernice. <laughs> yeah. And there's an incredible line where he says, we decided to get married even though we both knew it would be the end of us. Right? Mm -hmm. They knew they shouldn't be doing it. They did it anyway. Clearly, this is Poe talking about himself. There's mm -hmm. just no question, right? Mm -hmm. And then, as often happens, she gets in, in tales in Poe and more generally from the era, she gets some kind of wasting disease and <laughs> yeah. she starts, starts wasting away. <laughs> yeah. And the only thing that doesn't waste away are her teeth. So mm -hmm. she becomes kind of an empty, withered shell of her former self, except for her teeth, which mm -hmm. the narrator then focuses on obsessively, and he starts having difficulty maintaining a lucid grasp of reality. He right. blacks out. Can I can I give the can I give yes, a spoiler here? Yes. Okay. And eventually he doesn't really realize what has happened, but it turns out that in one of his blackouts, he has attacked his cousin wife and tore out, plied out her teeth and buried her alive, which he only realizes when he accidentally drops the box in which he has he has Kept saved her, teeth. her mm -hmm. teeth. And it's totally horrifying when you realize that that's what's happened. It's and, really... <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you just can't believe, again, this is a moment where you're like, couldn't they have said so this? This is really too much. But it is also plainly, plainly Poe suffering at his own his own role in the demise of what's her name? Eliza. Mm -hmm. Eliza Poe. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that, that the, the, the work is something we can separate from any reflection we might have on whether the person who created it was good or bad is really complicated by the fact that the work gets its character from the, the moral transgression of its creator, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so in a sense, what I found when I was writing about this was, much to my surprise, I share the conviction of people of the younger generation that we shouldn't read the art of, or we shouldn't be exposed to the art of morally monstrous people, right? I mean, I don't share it, but how should I put it? I don't share that view. But I also think that the view of my parents' generation, the view of my school teachers when I was in elementary school and we were reading The Telltale Heart, which was, oh, don't worry, this is just fiction, is mm -hmm. way too simplistic, right? Right, sure. Uh, or d don't worry, those teeth aren't real teeth, mm -hmm. is, as, I, as I, I'm inclined to put it, is to defang, so to speak, Poe's work. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that's what's really challenging and interesting that 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 I think I continue to think, unlike the censorious youth of today, mm -hmm. that that we do need to engage with transgressive art, that it's good for us. 
And it's good for us in part because there really is evil in the world. And mm -hmm. we don't want to, like, when we encounter evil, we don't want to be like, duh, what's that? Like, I've right. never seen this before. Right. We, we want to know about it, right? Right. And, and so, so we do need to encounter it. But, but simply saying, oh, this is just fiction, those aren't real teeth, is not going to cut it. Right. So I agree with all of that. And I think that, you know... Aristotle's great insight was that the human mind tends to extremes and the hard thing mm -hmm. is to find the, you know, rational mean in between them. Mm. And I think that you have articulated the two unpalatable extremes. Mm -hmm. And then the only yeah. interesting question is, all right, well, what's the, you know, what is the via media, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you're right. Like, so I do think that the artist can be separated from the art mm. to a certain extent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not complete, obviously, especially when we're talking about fiction. Mm -hmm. And that's because the artist's vision will mm -hmm. be in the work, right? Right. And I think, you know, it's kind of like Iris Murdoch makes some fancy distinctions here mm. where she'll say things like, well, the artist is virtuous with respect to his work, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of drawing on the the old timey sense of virtue. It's right, just like right, good yeah. habit with respect to the work. Mm -hmm. And then she thinks like that's something that is important. It's it's separate from the virtue that makes you good, you know, unqualified. <laughs> like good right, for life, right, good right. for living. Yeah. yeah. And then so she, she'll talk a lot about the artist's vision mm -hmm. and how that has to be truth revealing. Mm -hmm. You know, the artist has to have something to say, right? Mm -hmm. that, that needs to, or they have to have something to show or there has to be something in virtue of which we're going to call mm -hmm. it great art that's not simply mm -hmm. formal, right? Right. And all of that seems right to me. I, but mm -hmm. I think that... I think it doesn't touch, though, some of the worries that people who are censorious are mm -hmm. having. So, for mm -hmm. example, this doesn't really apply to Poe because he's dead. Mm -hmm. But for living artists like right. maybe Polanski or Woody mm -hmm. Allen, like they don't mm -hmm. want this person making money. Right. They don't want this person to have any place in society. They yeah. don't. Right. Yeah. And... Everything that Murdoch is saying isn't really going to touch that. Mm, right, right. Uh, because right, that's right. sort of just an economic question and a social yeah. question. Yeah. And I don't, I don't really know what to say about that other than like, I still really like Woody Allen's films. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, I, yeah. I didn't yeah. stop watching them. Right, 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 right. And I, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. know what to say about that. Like, Annie yeah. was a good movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And... Yeah. And I feel like, again, I, I, I think Poe is one of the greats. Mm. I think that people should read Poe precisely mm. because he's one of the greats. I mean, his influence on another deeply problematic literary figure mm. that I just did a podcast on, which is Baudelaire. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Baudelaire was his translator into French. Yeah. 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 Baudelaire mm. was obsessed with Poe, as you know. I mean, mm -hmm. loved him. And and I think you just see all of the ways yeah. in which he's so deeply yeah. influenced by him. Yeah. And of course, Baudelaire was like a terrible person. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. was terrible. Well, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, the whole decadent movement in France, I think, is deeply inspired by Poe, but also, I think, um, you know, trying to work out a kind of coherent view about evil in its relationship to art in a way right. that Poe never, never made explicit. Right. Um, and you get in Baudelaire and then in the late 19th century in France in general with this kind of flirtation with Satanism as an right. aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, I don't think Baudelaire himself was an actual Satanist, mm -hmm. though he certainly knew some people who were. Mm -hmm. the, the spirit of it was to probe evil because that is so, so to speak the best the best use of art right and i think you can kind of see the seeds of that in in poe 
but again, he leaves it implicit. And yeah, I mean, Poe, it's, uh, yeah, we, we would have to do another episode on that, but Poe is, and Poe and Woody Allen are both remarkable examples of Americans who are uh, taken up in France and then they just run with it um, mm -hmm. and make them in certain respects more sophisticated than they actually are, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And I love how that works, right? Mm -hmm. We Americans are actually pretty naive. We shoot from the hip. We call it like we see it. We mm -hmm. don't theorize too much, mm -hmm. but sometimes the French will seize onto that and then, you know, really, really run with it mm -hmm. i think and i think the poe baudelaire case is the is the classic example of this right right no. well so i i mean i'm interested in in how you read this story mm -hmm. do you want me to tell you how i read it first or do you who yeah. wants to go first okay go so ahead, okay so poe is obviously so all the time in poe's fiction there are, well, not all the time, but enough of the time that it's quite striking. You have people being buried alive, mm -hmm. right? As like yeah. a unique kind of horrible thing, right? Yeah. A, a unique kind of terror or horror. And sort of like, there are all these characters who, who have this realization that either they buried someone alive, either consciously or subconsciously or, or whatever. Yeah. So there's, there's this, theme and Poe of being buried alive. And then there's also this theme of um, not just death, of course, which is mm -hmm. everywhere, but madness, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of losing your mind mm -hmm. or for sure losing your reason, right? Mm -hmm. And I think you obviously have both of these in this mm -hmm. story, mm -hmm. but ultimately, like, I think this is a story about contemplation gone wrong. Mm -hmm. And that sort of relates to the artist in in a really important way, at least according mm -hmm. to lots of people, including Murdoch. Mm -hmm. So like the standard account of contemplation is that it's not just looking at something, although it is mm -hmm. vision, right? The mm -hmm. metaphor is always vision, not judgment or, yeah. or reasoning, but vision. But the idea is that it's a kind of beholding of an object of love. So contemplation yeah. is motivated by love, right? That's that's in Plato. Right. So contemplation is is beholding an object, it's a kind of loving vision, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also motivated by love. That's right mm. there in the symposium. It's it's in Aquinas, it's in Augustine. It's like the whole perennial philosophy seems to have this view about contemplation and its connection to love and desire. Mm -hmm. And this idea that the reason why it's the highest thing you can do, right, is that it's just, it's like this deep contact with reality, right? So if mm -hmm. you're contemplating well, then you both know what's worthy of your contemplation, but like yeah. you, you have this kind of love, right, yeah. for the object of contemplation. Yeah. And it's like the opposite. Right, he's, I mean, this whole story, he's looking obsessively, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But he, he talks about an undue, earnest, morbid attention. Yeah. It's like an obsessive yeah. attention to things, but it has the opposite effect. It's carrying him away from reality. Yeah. To yeah. the point where he loses contact with it altogether. Mm -hmm. And he talks about like being in a trance or being kind of mesmerized. And I think, yeah, by the end, he not only loses his grip on reality, but he ends up doing this like horrible stuff. And so it's like, to me, it's sort of like contemplation gone wrong. And mm -hmm. when you think about like, well, how can that go wrong? I think you have to look at the person, the character, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we already know, like in this tradition, you know, there's like the guy in the Republic who can't stop looking at the dead bodies right, or, yeah. or Augustine and spectacle, right? And lust mm -hmm. of the eyes and all of that. I, I don't, well, I mean, I'm curious. I don't think that's what's going on with this guy. Mm -hmm. It seems mm -hmm. like even worse somehow because he, you know, and on all of those cases, you can like run a guise of the good account. It's sort of like, well, 
it's bad to look at the gladiators kill one another, but it's also kind of thrilling, you know, yeah. or or something. Whereas here, I think he doesn't know why. Right. He's obsessively yeah. looking. Yeah. And he, he seems to realize that, like, it's morbid and undo. Like, it's not good, yeah. but he can't stop. Yeah. 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 And he ends up going mad. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's a lot to say there. I, I don't know what your rules are about quoting on, on the podcast, because uh, it is. They are worthwhile. quote as much as you want, especially okay. from the so, artist. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is the relevant part, right? The monomania, if I must so term it, consisted in a more moribund irritability, or sorry, a morbid irritability of those properties of the mind in metaphysical science termed the attentive. It is more than probable that I am not understood, but I fear indeed that it is no manner possible to convey to the mind of the merely general reader an adequate idea of that nervous intensity of interest with which, in my case, the powers of meditation, not to speak technically busied and buried themselves in the contemplation of even the most ordinary objects of the universe. Yeah. Like teeth. And that, yeah, like teeth. Yeah. <laughs> like teeth. Yeah. And it, it's definitely not like the case in Plato, where there is nothing good left to see in these dead bodies. And arguably, that's also different from the spectacle of gladiators, where you can mm. at least see the triumph, you know, when it's happening, mm -hmm. you don't just see corpses. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's significant that he's focusing on the one part of her that's left that that that's still as it should be, and that becomes something wonderful only by contrast with the rest of her disappearing body, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he wouldn't notice that she has beautiful teeth, or he wouldn't particularly delay on her beautiful teeth. But indeed, the problem or the, 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 the moral character of the attention isn't something that's determined by the thing being attended to. It's mm -hmm. entirely in the way that it warps his own sense of reality and his own priorities yeah so i think i think you're absolutely right about that and it's a it's a it's a fascinating passage um the 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 faculties that the metaphysical that metaphysical science has has deemed attentive yeah yeah <laughs> and how is... how these how these can go wrong i suppose um i mean this is this is not the era in which people would be talking about fetishes and perversions, but there is some kind of perversity in the idea of, of getting monomaniacally focused on mm -hmm. a single part of a person, mm -hmm. right? Right. On a single trait that, you know, indeed eclipses their humanity. Yeah, and it's interesting because the character in this story is not an artist. He's an intellectual mm -hmm. of some kind. He was like literally mm -hmm. born in the library and never leaves. And mm -hmm. it says like, oh, our line has been called a race of visionaries, mm -hmm. which I think is uh, he's having some fun there right. with, yeah, that's a good with point. this yeah. story. But he, it's it's sort of like whatever... Whatever intellectual life he had, it seems to have gone wrong at yeah. some point. And it's sort of like not clear if the forces are internal or external. I mean, right. he doesn't, I just think he, I think one of the reasons why his stories are scary is because he just doesn't explain everything. Right, right, but right. If you there, but there are these other stories, like the fall of the House of Usher, right. and then um, the Oval Portrait, where right. they are artists, you know, yeah. who in both of those stories they're painting, yeah, and you yeah. and you have a very similar dynamic unfolding. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, you know, in the fall of the House of Usher, and in other stories, he's drawing on this familiar theme of decadent nobility, which 
which makes a lot more sense in the stories of his that are set in Europe. I think this is another interesting question, like the Europe versus America, like, you know, which of his stories thematize issues in the United States, in virtue of which we can say Poe is a very American author. Mm -hmm. With The Fall of the House of Usher, he's projecting a kind of fantasy old world where noble lineages uh, fizzle out and Mm -hmm. get get enfeebled and lame. And we and, you know, when you catch them at their tail end before disappearing altogether, there's something particularly grotesque about them. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, that you get a little bit of that in in Bernice, he comes from a line of people who were once greater than mm-hmm. he is, and now this is just the he's just the last breath of this line. Um, but it's not uh, it's not uh, uh, in the old world terms of aristocracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which and so he ends up murdering, right? Yeah, his, right, right, right. His cousin. <laughs> right but yeah. it but it wait but he's not it i mean he's not murdering her intentionally as it were no. because he doesn't know that he was doing it when he did it right he he sort of realized he he infers <laughs> right, right, right that he right, was right. the agent <laughs> yeah from the evidence right right, that, right. That is well there's also clear. the the um the servant who comes mm-hmm. in with the report of the woman being born, buried alive. Right. I, as I recall, the servant doesn't know that her teeth has, have been pulled, mm-hmm. but he does know that she's buried alive. Mm-hmm. The servant doesn't know that he did it, does he? No, no, right. I don't think so. No, no. Right. That's, and it's, it's really literally only in the last sentence when the right. teeth um, right. spill down on the floor yes. That, yes. That, we, that we learn what's going on. And I right. guess, I, I think I read that the editor of the magazine this was published in asked for this to be altered and Poe stood his ground. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm glad so. he did. It's really, I like it really. It's very effective. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, the oval portrait, which is kind of like a reverse... Mm. Portrait of Dorian Gray. Right, right. That, which is only four pages, three and a half pages. It's like super right. short. I mean, what is is that kind of a commentary on art at all? Do you think? I suppose what it summarized for me the the um the the kind of basic sequence of events in the oval portrait well it's fine if you don't remember this one we don't have to talk about it but it's just like it literally is like a reverse dorian gray so it's like Uh he's uh you know um in in painting her like she dies right oh right of course yeah of course yeah yeah okay and yeah this does also echo a lot of what we get in bernice in that it is it is pretty sadistic towards the 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 person who's the 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 object of of the mm-hmm. of the person's attention and maybe yeah that's a really interesting now i'm i'm looking at the oval portrait and it's all coming back to me yeah. i mean that's really interesting because the the narrator of bernice is not an artist the narrator of the oval portrait is um mm-hmm. but the effect is largely the same it's the in both cases it's the monomaniacal focus that is destroying the right. the it, 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 it's its target right right and i mean this is a familiar theme thinking of the the french film la belle noiseuse with emmanuel béard you know the the painter who destroys the woman he's painting right it's, it's psychologically, but in, in Poe, it's also, it's also literally. Right, right? and it's also um, sort of like, how can he really be painting her if he does not notice that she's dying? Right, 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 right. right. And, 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 and like when he finishes, he says, and it's hilarious. It's like, this mm. is like one of those really dark comedy moments in Poe that I love. Right, right, he right, says, right, right. Oh, th- <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's objectively hilarious. Uh, while he gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid and aghast and crying with a loud voice. This is indeed life itself. 
<laughs> turned suddenly to regard his beloved. She was dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you weren't actually representing life itself. Like, it's yeah. like you're not seeing, right? Right. right it's right, somehow right. to me like another example of of not seeing. Yeah, but also, I mean, the kind of the the ultimate ambition of art on a certain conception of it is a kind of metempsychosis, right? Where you transfer the life from the from the subject into your artistic creation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you could get that for free, that you could get a portrait that is, so to speak, ensouled without without harming the soul of the person of whom you're making the portrait would just be getting something for nothing. It's impossible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think that that seems to be part of the message. But again, yeah, very, a very steady preoccupation through a number of his stories with, yeah, with the danger of art, right? With the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the fact that you, that you, I can't help but contemplate when I'm reading Poe that art is not hermetically sealed off from our, our concerns about harming other people and doing other people good, right? right? So, you know, the fact that he thematizes this is, you know, very instructive. It shows that he might be, he might be conscious of the way he's affecting his readers. Right. Very interesting. Well, so, I mean, so the larger philosophical question, which is about, you know, how does art handle evil or why mm. focus on evil and death and decay and obsession and madness and terror? What, I mean, what, what is your take on why Poe is doing that? <laughs> what, um, I, I mean, he is in some ways very inscrutable, right? It, like, why is he doing it? Because uh, because it sells, and he needs to earn mm -hmm. a living. Yeah. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's that that's one that's one answer, right? I mean, we know that he's the first American author ever to try to actually uh, make a career of writing mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. only writing, and he was extremely anxious and precarious about this his whole life. And there's something clearly crowd pleasing about Bo. So then the question becomes, well, why does this please crowds? Mm -hmm. And I I suppose, you know, I don't know the 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 genealogy of this, but there are strands, you know, of, of this fashion that he's clearly borrowing from predecessors from Walpole and even perhaps from Mary Shelley from romantic poets from german authors like eta hoffman so you know this the, in some sense he's he's just kind of following a fashion as well then that pushes us back to the further question well why is this a fashion <laughs> right and i suppose you know here we're getting to a question that's not about the history of literature but about human psychology and maybe anthropology, right? Like what, what is that experience of being, being freaked out, right? That is kind of fun, but that is a fun that's derived from the fact that the world is actually a really terrifying place. I've, I've admitted I don't like watching horror films. <laughs> You probably, you might have some better insight because you do like watching horror films. But for me, I think I would have very little patience for horror, for the kind of belaboring of questions of death and, and evil in Poe if it weren't cut with humor, right? But then this in turn... Uh, gets me back to a kind of very different consideration, which is, you know, what does humor do for us? Not what does horror do for us? What mm -hmm. does humor do for us? And I see Poe as a master of sublimating 
the horror of this world through a lens of satire, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe I, I see more satire than, than is actually there because it's my, it's my inclination. I mean, it comes through clearer in some stories than in others. The ones that are categorized as grotesques Right, mm -hmm. the interview interview with the mummy, for example, mm -hmm. and the 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 efforts to you know the one where the the person is reanimated, and you know these kinds of stories are are just straightforwardly sublimating what would otherwise be horrible into something that is that is that is no longer horrible i don't Funny, know how to say absurd it. Any, yeah, like anymore yeah 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 and that's 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 something i think again as i as i put it earlier very different from what someone like mary shelley is trying to do and that it makes me think that quite likely i have to say i'm is still not a big fan of the gothic horror genre. I'm only a fan of its outliers, right? Mm. The ones who the ones who engage it with a with a different sensibility. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I mean, you know, like a lot of people will say Poe invents Southern Gothic fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, he was Southern. He's from Virginia. He went to UVA mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. he like spent some time in Boston, but he considered Virginia home, specifically mm -hmm. Richmond, Virginia, which oh, apparently yeah. there's a Edgar Allan Poe Museum in, okay. in Richmond. Yeah, I found that out earlier this morning. <laughs> cool. It's kind of funny what they put in his biography and what they don't. But, um, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and my two favorite writers who are placed in that genre would be Flannery O'Connor and William yeah. Faulkner. And, uh, you know, I, I have a line, a very clear line, a very Catholic line about mm -hmm. what Flannery is up to mm -hmm. with all mm -hmm. of the evil mm -hmm. and the violence and the mm -hmm. horror in mm -hmm. her stories. And it's not, you know, it's, um, for her, it's about sin and grace. Right. And the need for redemption and the reality of sin and the need for grace. And yeah. the fact that, like, grace is given to murderers, right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that that grace is given to sinners, to people who mm -hmm. are scary, right? Who mm -hmm. do scary things and to weirdos and, and misfits mm -hmm. and outcasts and yeah, the whole thing. And, but, like, I don't know what... Poe is doing and then and then he's the one like supposedly like inventing this genre and it just kind of raises this bigger question for me like well what what is the genre really you know is it more than atmospherics because it's yeah. definitely an atmosphere right that we okay. can all recognize this is so interesting, and I'm just having this flash now that you bring up Flannery O'Connor, whom I still haven't read, but we talked about her also when you and I did the last podcast episode on Cormac McCarthy and on right. Chatry. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that in Cormac McCarthy, where we also have just, you know, massive, epic violence yes. and evil yes. and no grace, nonetheless, I, I'm able to read Cormac McCarthy as maybe a sort of Catholic novelist, nonetheless, right. by a sort mm -hmm. of via negativa, right? right? It's like, this is what the world looks like when you don't consider the possibility of grace, right? right? It's, it's horrible, right? right. Now, I, And he I was think also I, Southern and raised Catholic. Yeah, yeah. So I would be prepared to say that about Cormac McCarthy. I would not be prepared to say that about Edgar Allan Poe. He's not even stabbing around in the dark to get to grace, right? Mm -hmm. He's not following a via negativa uh, to show you what's missing from the world when, when you conceive it only, uh, uh, let's say, within the imminent realm of human suffering, right? Mm -hmm. 
there might be something he doesn't know <laughs> that you can that you as the reader can um can super add but i don't see it in poe himself and i think that's very curious and i'm just now having that realization and a, a very very marked difference between two different kinds of authors both of which kinds delve into themes of violence and transgression and both of which unlike flannery o'connor fail to or refuse to center or highlight the theme of grace as mm -hmm. well right well what do you think like i mean do you think that there is any kind of coherent answer to the question about the value of probing evil in art for poe well i mean it might be that and now i mean it's funny because i was having trouble remembering the oval portrait but it might be that, you know, if we take the, the rather skeletal or abortive plot of, of the Oval Portrait seriously, it might be that, that he wants to say something like the creation of art just is evil, right? I mean, I mean it, it's a major kind of step away from our ordinary conception of morality and you should be prepared if you want to create a portrait or a story to kill someone right i mean that's that's maybe mm. the bold way of putting it that mm -hmm. that he that he doesn't think that this is an incidental connection and there are two different ways of seeing that if you if you acknowledge what i've said so far one is that, oh, well, then art is horrible. And another is that, well, art is really a weighty matter, right? It's mm -hmm. a really serious thing to try to transfer another person's soul into a painting, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you set about that and you know what the, you know, how serious it is, then you're doing something that is not, not morally insignificant. Right. right. Well, Could another, be. yeah, I mean, another aspect of that story, the oval portrait, is that the wife, mm. he's, he's painting his wife, right? is that she's very jealous of right. his main love, which is not her, right. but right, art. Right, 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 right. And, yeah. and, you know, I don't know if that also is meant to be autobiographical to any extent, or right. a commentary on his own relationships. I mean, he really only had two, right? There was right. the cousin love right. and the cousin adolescent love. And then there was his old flame from high from right. college. Right, 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 right. She ended yeah. up being a widow and he went back to her. Right, right, right. But he right, kind right. of always had a woman taking care of him. Right, right, right. <laughs> and and you sort of imagine... <laughs> what kind of role that was and sort yeah. of given his output, what his priority was. Right. Right. You know, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. It just is yeah. something that, and then it's also like, you know, we talked earlier about his range, which is very mm -hmm. impressive. And mm -hmm. I, and I, at least, I think he's a great writer. I don't know mm -hmm. about you, but I, I really, I think he's a great writer. I enjoy reading him. I don't really know what to do with the detective fiction. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's no, not that I, I, I don't like the... it, but it's just like, it's just like, and now here's something completely different, also written by Edgar yeah. Allan Poe. Like what? Well, yeah, I mean, it's amazing, though, that it, it kind of establishes the, 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 the pattern, you know, it yeah. gives us the recipe, the murders in the Rue Morgue. Uh, it's like, you're, I recently watched Knives Out, you know, this movie with mm -mm. Daniel Craig in it playing a Southern detective. <laughs> yeah. And anyhow, it's just, you know, a, a popular entertainment uh, uh -huh. kind of making light of themes familiar from Agatha Christie oh, and sure. so on. Mm -hmm. 
And when you read the murders in the Rue Morgue, you're like, this is, this is the, the ortext of all of that. And it's amazing how well he does it. That's the, that one, that's the yeah. one where the killer's an orangutan, right? Yeah. And that's also interesting <laughs> yeah. because there are, there are at least two, two stories. There's another story in, a, in the mental asylum in the south of France uh-huh. that is supposed to be a satire of Southern American racism. Mm. I have my doubts about that, mm. but that's what some commentators have said. Mm-hmm. And then in The Murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, there is you know, a much more compelling case that it is a racist text, given that you know the whole story is that the the whoops and hollers of the orangutan are uh, are interpreted by all of the people who hear it as some sort of Asiatic or perhaps African language. So we know right. the the murderer is a foreigner, and then it's only the this this sharp French detective or you know amateur sleuth who figures out that it is an escaped orangutan. Mm-hmm. And this is, you know, I'm, I have a side interest in the history of primatology that we could talk about some other time. But it is just amazing to see, to see him coming up with a plot twist that is just so farfelu, so 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 ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And nonetheless, having you totally swept along mm-hmm. in the story. And kind of buying into the ridiculousness. I mean, that's one of the great things about Poe that that it can be so ridiculous, and you are able to just go along with it. Mm-hmm. But also, it's extremely violent. That story is extremely violent, and it is. you know the 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 violence that the orangutan commits against mm-hmm. this woman and her daughter involves graphic detail that we did not mm-hmm. need to mm-hmm. need to have. Mm-hmm. And this is, again, I think, you know, part of uh, the it, it borrows this intensity of imagery from the more straightforwardly gothic pieces, right? Even if we would classify it in terms of genre as detective fiction. Right. I mean, yeah. And I think what's. Yeah. So, again, you have a story about a, a very gruesome and violent killing Mm. of innocence right Mm -hmm. and and but there's also like the intrigue and the figuring it out and yeah and for a while i sort of felt like wait is this like something supernatural and then i'm like oh no it's a it's a wild animal right yeah and there's this kind of there's this figure the inspector yeah yeah, like the dopey police commissar. That's right. another yeah. trope of detective That's fiction right. that comes right. Yeah, yeah. And and it's sort of like, okay, well, how do I, how am I supposed to think about that as a work of mm. art, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. it's it's entertaining, mm. right? But I don't think of detective fiction as like great yeah. art, right? Right. I mean, right. Right. It's well, yeah. <laughs> It, I mean, it depends, you know, it, it all depends what you do with it, I guess. Um, and um, I'm more kind of of the view that you can, you can take scaffold from any genre and, and build great art upon it. I'm, but, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. But I'm just wondering in this particular case, mm, like, what's the case that this is like really worth reading? Yeah. Other than I, that, I it's think, been important. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's just it's interesting more as as an or text, and the same thing can be said for the the more kind of science fiction oriented texts, like mm-hmm. the one the 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 Maelstrom one, you know, where, I haven't read that where he's spinning around in a whirlpool and <laughs> and. <laughs> And sees the other ships going down the whirlpool and is spinning for hours along mm-hmm. the kind of outer perimeter of it. It is just crazy to think, like, uh, especially in the absence of 
technological aids to the imagination that start mm -hmm. to appear mm -hmm. around the turn of the 20th century, mm -hmm. how someone could conceive a scenario as ridiculous as that, mm -hmm. right? And I suppose, I mean, there are a, a lot of this uh, has roots in authors like Daniel Defoe and the kind of older history of adventure tales on the high seas. And then, and then Poe kind of twists it to have a kind of a hint of the supernatural. Mm -hmm. And, and again, here, I think this is, I think, particularly interesting. And I'll I'll get off the science fiction stuff in a minute, but I think that Poe gives us like the missing link between ocean navigation and space travel as the, the sites of the projection of our imagination and lust for adventure, right? Yeah. He's starting to incorporate familiar tropes from space travel science fiction of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, while still having the events play out on the high seas, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's just amazing. Is it, is it high art? Well, again, here, as with the detective pieces, it, it's, it's noteworthy because it's an ore text, because mm -hmm. it establishes a recipe that will be used again and again afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's that's all you need. But I I I think I certainly am probably with you on this point that my the ones I like best are the ones that we could classify either as gothic horror or mm -hmm. as grotesque mm -hmm. yeah. rather than a rather than as science fiction or yeah. as detective. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do think that there's a value to being scared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I really do. So, I mean, I love reading. I, I love reading scary stories with my kids, like especially mm -hmm. the younger kids, mm -hmm. uh, not super young. Like, you know, there's, there's definitely like too young for that. Mm -hmm. And I, I loved ghost stories when I was a kid. Mm hmm. And loved, um, I don't know, just like I said, I, I like horror. And mm. I don't, um, maybe it's bad, but I don't, I'm not convinced that it's bad because I think it's good to fear evil. Um, <laughs> and I think that what's happening in, in all of those experiences is that you experience this fear and this dread and this horror but like at a safe enough distance mm -hmm. right yeah that you can sort of say to yourself it's not real right yeah. and that and that is almost part of the pleasure of it yeah like when you are really terrified in the middle of a horror film mm. and you can sort of like engage in an inner dialogue with yourself like wait it's not real <laughs> Mm. Like you can, oh, you know, because yeah. because you're all your instincts are to just run out of the room. Like, oh, my it's gosh. not real, but it is real. <laughs> well, yeah, and I guess I guess it is real in the sense that it, it does. It does exist in the world in some form. But here, I guess we're getting to pose romanticism and the notion of the romantic sublime. Right. Where right. the romantic is supposed to enjoy standing on an alpine precipice or on mm -hmm. a cliff by the side of the mm -hmm. ocean because mm -hmm. um, this is a, an occasion for contemplating your own nothingness against the great forces of nature while also not actually being in any immediate risk. Right. right. You just right. stare at it. And in a way, it's like, is the, is, you know, looking at the scenario of someone being buried alive, like looking out at the ocean at night or off of a cliff or something like that? Can we extend the notion of the romantic sublime to include dead bodies? Mm -hmm. I, I suppose, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting variation on the notion of the sublime that 
I, I'm sure someone has written about this, whereas I'm, sure. I'm just riffing, yeah. riffing off, off the top yeah. of my head. Uh, I would say, you know, off the top of my head, I would say, well, they these two things have a lot in common, right? Mm -hmm. We are we're interested in contemplating at a safe distance those things that are more powerful than we are. Right. <laughs> Infinitely more powerful, such as, for example, the ocean or outer space. But also, for example, death, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that there, there you have it. The gothic, the gothic horror tale is is a spinoff of the romantic sublime, right? right? Right. It's a peculiar kind of memento mori, perhaps. Yeah. But yeah, I do think he was he was very. I mean, I I didn't read a bunch of scholarship to prepare for mm. this, but yeah. But I do know that he was very influenced by various philosophical accounts of the sublime, of course, including yeah. Burke. And, mm -hmm. and it's interesting, his original collection of short stories was called The Grotesque and the Arabesque. Right, yeah. Yeah. I'm not totally sure what is meant by the arabesque, but I think it, mm. you know, it's not, I don't know. Do you have thoughts about that? I, offhand, no. I mean, yeah. that's often used to describe it's almost used as a synonym of like baroque right mm -hmm. like when you have twists and curly cues beyond right. necessity right or yeah. something like, like that. the patterns that you see right yeah. on yeah. a manuscript yeah. maybe or something but yeah. but i think yeah. it's more yeah. but I, I think it connotes something more like beauty Right. It's yeah. not, it just has a totally different connotation than grotesque. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, you know, it's hard to say offhand. I mean, there could also be a connection in the early 19th century in the United States. This could have associations of like a thousand and one nights and, mm -hmm. you know, that part of the world where they just tell really good tales, mm -hmm. right? Tales mm -hmm. that go beyond the ordinary. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I, it, mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a good question. Again, I'm I, I I'm just giving educated stabs here. Yeah, <laughs> rather, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the other mm. thing is, of course, it is 19th century fiction, and the 19th century was just super weird. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially when it comes to the history of science. Like, it's just some really, really, really mm. weird oh, stuff. Oh yeah, going yeah. On. You know, I I wanted to mention this book by this the, a friend of mine based at the Warburg Institute in London about Edgar Allan Poe and the birth of American science. It's, it's John Tresh. It's called The Reason for the Darkness of the Night. Mm -hmm. And then Edgar Allan Poe and the Forging of American Science or something like that. And like Mary Shelley, there is a lot of stuff about galvanism and electricity and and animal magnet magnetism and and this preoccupation with this moment of transition from you know l experimental science as a dark art mm -hmm. of conjuring evil forces as in mm -hmm. like paracelsus right. on the one hand and on the other hand science as something that is really going to give us sovereign power over nature right mm -hmm. in a way that we we must take up or it's our fate mm -hmm. to take up mm -hmm. right which is the view of science that emerges by the end of the end of the 19th century right so but but john tresh uh, also is interested in the way in the united states in particular this happened mostly via isolated weirdos right mm -hmm. like like edgar Allan poe mm -hmm. right and the the birth of or the you know these familiar tropes of what we now think of as the history of science emerge out of these proto science fiction imaginings, mm -hmm. right? I think I think Tresh is really really good at explaining Poe's role in this, and we haven't even talked about the most relevant text of Poe's for this, the 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 long kind of nonfiction essay called Eureka, right? I haven't Which read is, that. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. It's 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 wild, and he's trying to present himself as a serious thinker, 
he's definitely an autodidact. And, yeah, you know, coming at the coming at these questions from a uh, from the point of view of someone with a lot of imagination and it, without any institutional standing. Yeah. And the fact, the fact that that could have played such an important role in uh, the coming together of early American ideas about science, I think, is quite important. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I will read that essay because there's still some, oh, yeah. there's still some November left. And you oh, will yeah. watch the John Carpenter movie, The Thing. Oh, yeah. Wait, oh, The Thing. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I can do that. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. But we should, we should probably close it out. But oh, yeah. this was really fun. Edgar Allan yeah. Poe's like my, one of my favorite weirdo, problematic favorites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Your like, fave is problematic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's my, one of my problematic favorites, right? Like, I know he wasn't <laughs> a good guy. <laughs> yeah. Didn't live an admirable life and... And his fiction is really dark, but I, I love it. I don't know. Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. It was formative. So for me. cool, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was um, belatedly formative for me. Like I said, I'm I'm just now getting around to it. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad that you liked it. I'm glad that you liked it. So mm -hmm. anyway, always a pleasure to talk to you. Of course, let's do it again sometime really soon. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast that is generously underwritten by the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and produced by Catholics for Hire, a group of young Catholic digital content freelancers. Special thanks, as always, goes to Will Dethridge, Bea Cause, and Joe Coleman for their work in editing and producing this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider giving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Positive means five stars. You can also support the podcast by becoming a monthly patron at patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod. Patrons enjoy many benefits like tote bags and coffee mugs with exclusive artwork and also free digital subscriptions to either The Lamp or The Point magazines. For our next episode, I will be joined by Tony Domestico, to talk about T.S. Eliot, the critic and the poet. Until then, friends, be well and keep reading and happy new year.